Hello, everyone. Really glad to have you here today for the next session in our Devan and Beyond series, where we take you through a series of topics and activities related to building out on Oracle Cloud. We're here every first and third Tuesday at the same time. So if you missed any of our previous sessions, you can find the recordings on our Devon and Beyond page. And while you are there, please spend a moment to review the other series and webinars that we have added there. For anyone who might be new to these events, welcome. We are hosted on Cloud Customer Connect, which is our Oracle community forum for end users. Our topic today is best practices to design and operate Oracle Cloud. In this session, we'll showcase how to use best practices to your advantage when working on OCI. In each service, you can choose from an array of features based on your goals, and Oracle recommends a set of best practices to design and operate cloud topologies that deliver the maximum business value. My name is Renu Bhatt, Program Lead for the Customer Enablement Team here at Oracle, and our presenters for today are Jason Cook, Len Lois, and Olivia Ferda, a good lineup of expert presenters. And with that, please enjoy the session. Jason, please take over. Excellent. Thanks, Renu. So today's agenda, um, we're going to go just through a few of the best practices. I mean, we could spend an entire day, but... Um, what we're going to focus in on is leveraging best practices around building out cloud native solutions. And we'll use a scenario as a backdrop to, you know, how that works. Along the way, I'm going to share some experiences that I see in the field. So in my role, I get to work with customers building out and architecting solutions in OCI. So as we go through, I'll sprinkle in a couple of things I'm seeing out there today. We'll do a demo, and then we're going to switch into best practices, um, kind of at a summary level for multi-cloud as well. And then the key takeaways at the very end. So um, objective today, a little bit learning about best practices, cloud native, a little bit around multi-cloud. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is gonna re kind of revolve around four major topics. And this is generally where I spend a lot of my time with customers around these four, okay? And what do we mean by best practices? Like what, what does that actually entail that you know someone in my role delivers as we're working with customers? Generally, when I'm working with customers, it falls into four areas. I spend a lot of time on security and compliance. How do I make sure the bad guys stay out of your environment? But also, how do we make sure your own teams have the right access to the right environments um, so they don't inadvertently blow something up? Oftentimes, we'll call this, how do I enable blast rate isolation for my dev teams, for my infrastructure teams, so that we can test quickly, but at the same time, not impact production? Um, the past two years, there's been a huge shift on cost optimization, right? As a lot of teams started moving things to the cloud, they moved rapidly but oftentimes at the sacrifice of knowing how much would it cost for me at the end of the day. And so a good portion of my time here over the past 18 months, two years is now that I'm here, how do I optimize my licenses, my hardware? How do I scale down? We talk a lot about how to scale up for events, but how do I know when it's time to scale workloads down that are maybe over-provisioned? Um, operational efficiency, this is very old. This is the, um, there's always too much work at, on IT for all of us and not enough people to get it done. And cloud doesn't necessarily change this, but it does give us some opportunities to shift who's got the burden of taking care of some things like hardware lifecycle maintenance. You know, how do I optimize my time so I can spend it on higher value activities as opposed to just keeping the lights on? And then reliability and re reliance, um, resiliency. This is where I've got a lot of my history in IT is how do I make sure that I build my workloads in such a way that if Oracle as a provider has an issue or you have an issue that gets introduced inadvertently, that I can ride that out and that my end users don't see any impact. Or if there's a major event, how can I make sure I recover my environment and my key data to another location? Okay, so when we talk about best practices, oftentimes it's gonna be around these four areas to ensure that you do this very well with any workloads you host inside the cloud. Okay, so let's talk about a solution. Sometimes it's helpful to have kind of like a backdrop, a story as we talk through this. And the solution we're gonna use is just, uh, we're gonna call an app Vision Corp. It's a classic three-tier web application. It's got a front end on-premise today with a load balancer. Um, this on-premise environment's got a web component, an app, and it's got a back-end Oracle database. And you've been asked by your leadership team to migrate to the cloud, but they want to modernize it, right? They, they want it not to be just a lift and shift where you pick it up as is, which is just a server move, and drop it in the cloud. And we're going to talk about what the heck does that mean that you know, you're supposed to modernize. Um, they also want to make sure that this application, when it's moved in and, and, and modernized, it integrates with all the other applications that you have and any kind of monitoring observability. And we'll, we'll touch upon that just a little bit as well. Okay. So when the leadership team or a group says, I want to modernize, oftentimes what that means is 
they're looking for us to use open source frameworks or something a little more modern that would that is on premise today. Example of that. Um, what's been real popular I've seen out in the field here lately is the move to open telemetry. Being able to send your metrics about your, your app, its health, its number of hits, its number of users, its CPU, its memory, um, faults, to more open source free type tools like your Prometheus and Grafana. So you can have dashboards to find out um, am I encountering a 500 gateway errors to my server? And how do I make sure I dashboard and alert that out, right? When they talk about modernizing, they're talking about not building like you used to before, not installing a, a fleet of Linux or Windows servers and installing traditional web packages on top of that. What's been popular in the field is a move to containerization. And who's been winning the battle is the, the, the Kubernetes platform is something I speak with customers with every week. How can I containerize my app? What does your Kubernetes service look like? How does how does Oracle host that for me? Um, you know, the past couple of years, when it comes to modernization, we've all enjoyed um, modern apps that got us through COVID. And I think of things like being able to buy things online and pick up up the curb, right? That was definitely a COVID type push where whether you went to Walmart or Target, you kind of expected to be able to not get out of the car and you know keep the cooties away and just pick stuff up from your car. And at the same time, those first, you know, buy online pickup apps were kind of terrible. And we expected them to get better over time. They did rapidly. But how do you do that? How do you, as a developer, build your environment so that you can rapidly deploy enhancements every week, every month, sometimes every day to make sure you're driving the best user experience for apps like that or your loyalty programs, right? So you got to have pipelines. You've got to build things that enable your developers to be able to rapidly deploy to those environments, right? Along the way, we've got to be efficient with our time. Right? We can't continue to support environments like we have today. We can't do lift and shifts and hope that somehow we can keep up with the increased workload. So we need to use more fully managed service from our cloud providers. Things where you're shifting the burden of your hardware and your hardware maintenance and lifecycle events to us as the provider. And then again, you can focus on those higher level activities of you know developing new services or optimizing what you have. And then in monitoring, um, being able to monitor when you've got an issue and trace it back that's just table stakes now, right? When something dies in the middle of the night, you need to be able to have clear visibility to, was it the load balancer? Is the server, uh, did we deploy something last night? And that caused the issue at the exact time of the deployment. Um, these are things that are absolutely essential when you deploy anything in the cloud. And then again, that resiliency and recovery. If something breaks, and hardware always breaks, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, how do I make sure that 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 fault doesn't impact my users, that they can continue using the service and not notice there's some sort of issue in the background. If there's a major event, how can I make sure I don't lose my data, whether that's you know some sort of malware or it's some large data center event, how can I recover and continue running in another region? Again, these are, these are things that as we talk about, how do I modernize? These are discussion points we have with the customer to make sure as they're building out things that are new or migrating, that we've walked through some of these high points to make sure that they're modern and not running the workload like they may be doing on premise today. Okay. Um, in OCI, there's a whole soup of services. I'm not going to cover all these, but the ones that are popular today is, you know, I talked about Kubernetes and uh, the things that go around that, the container registry and being able to snap into things like event bridge and notifications for alerts. Um, we still have some of the more traditional cloud native tools, your API gateway, the catalogs, the ability to stream data. Um, Gen AI um, is definitely on the top of the hype curve right now. None of us can escape not hearing about Gen AI every week, if not every day. We have some of those same PaaS managed services for your data scientists, for your data engineers, for the folks doing analytics. And of course, you know the, the table stakes of you know, monitoring, observability, alerting, traceability is, is there on our platform as well. Okay, so let's come back to our, our Vision Corp example. Uh, Three-tier app, on-premise, traditional Windows, Linux servers, uh, back-end database. What that would start looking like, you know, as we thought about how could we host this in the cloud would be, again, we'd still have a load balancer. It'd be a PaaS service, right, where we're managing the hardware for you and the hardware lifecycle events, the, the failover events, the replacing it out. And then user customer um, have the ability to specify how much bandwidth, how much power do you want that load balancer to have? And then specifying how much you know bandwidth it has, just having to pay for that amount of bandwidth and not having to pay for something that's uh, over-provisioned. On the web and app tier, this is where we bring in Kubernetes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but having that service layer there so I can scale in and out based on my workload. And on the, the bottom end of the tier, you know, being able to use the Oracle database in the most, I'd say, modern and hands-free way would be our autonomous database. This would be an offering where we take care of all the hardware lifecycle events. 
And as a customer, you can configure things like, how do I want it to scale? Do I want it to scale up three times my CPU capacity um, when there's an additional load? How do I want to do my backups? But you're not having to worry about how do I maintain my hardware for failover? How do I set up you know, redundancy in the back end? We take care of that for you. This is potential landing spots for that, that Vision Corp application, okay, and how it could look. Let me dive in a little bit microservices. Um, Cause I said, that's this definitely one of the things as, as an architect I'm getting pulled into from our customers quite often. You know, your Vision Corp app um, would be hosted as a container. That top layer you see there in the picture, right? that's where your customer is gonna interact. That's where they're gonna log on. That's where you're gonna deploy your new features, your new code is in that top level that sometimes is returned as a pod or a container or an app. That's where that lives, okay? And the middle layer is all your Kubernetes orchestration tools, right? The ability to do a, a Docker push and pull, the ability to schedule where apps are gonna deploy it across your pods and how it's gonna scale and how it's gonna respond to changes in workloads, right? That whole orchestration layer lives there in the middle. You would consume that as a PaaS service, right? There's not servers that you have to manage there, just a service endpoint you would connect to to drive all your configuration and app container events. On the bottom would be your worker nodes. This would be more where your traditional compute storage and memory lies on, right? This is where those pods and everything runs on top of. And there's a couple of different ways we provide this. We provide offerings where we kind of share the management of it. We take care of the hardware, there's offerings where we fully take it on over. And then there's even offerings where all you have to worry about is just the, the container itself. But this is basically the three layers of how your container or your app would run on a Kubernetes environment. And we can't get into a deep dive on this. There's a lot of good videos on this, but it's definitely something, if you're not up to speed on Kubernetes, I would definitely recommend um, going out there and checking out some of our videos. There's some really good videos online and on YouTube, just generic about Kubernetes. Um, if you're an expert on this, I probably didn't go deep enough for you, but this is definitely something that's it's very popular right now as we're talking about how do I modernize, how do I become more cloud native, okay? Around Kubernetes, um, we have a lot of services that can pull in, right? So with Vision Corp, our leadership team said, we wanna make sure that you pull in observability and monitoring and things like having audit trails of who logged on and what was spun up, what was deprovisioned from a capacity standpoint. Those autos snap into our observability and monitoring tools. Um, the ability to use the networking that you have in OCI, whether you want to pull IPs uh, right from your network that you've defined, your, your 10 dot something something space, or whether you want to have your own kind of internal Kubernetes network. Um, we snap into your pipelines, right? Whether you're using your own custom pipeline or you're doing something hybrid where you're using like a resource manager to be able to, to drive infrastructure events. The build out of a cluster um, is definitely something we support. And of course, I am, right? Who can access prod? Who can access non-prod? What can I do inside the cluster, right? What kind of events, what kind of uh, access am I gonna give my infrastructure guys versus my app guys? So they both have separations of duties. All these things kind of wrap around a cloud native workload that could be hosted on something like OKE. So that again, you as a customer don't have to manage these things manually. You've got toolage wrapped all around you for security, for resiliency, um, for that observability of what's going on. Okay. We take a little farther, we talk about code pipelines. Like this is something that's key. And I have I still continue to run into customers today that are deploying you know, all their services manually on the cloud. And it works at first until they get up to scale and then it becomes a nightmare because they can't reproduce what they did a year ago or two years ago because it was never done as code. But I absolutely recommend, you know, as, as you think about a cloud native workload, you need to have a pipeline to deploy things like your OKE clusters, right? And that includes where do I store my secure code? Where do I have my trusted images that I'm going to run on? Um, are there approval processes, right, for production uh, so that just not anybody can deploy things into prod? And then how do I flow all that through so that my developers can deploy rapidly? Again, the idea is I want to deploy in a way that I have some blast radius isolation, but in a way that I've also supported my develop teams to deploy enhancements quickly, sometimes daily, that they, they get these updates out there so that they have the best user experience for whatever applications our end users are using. Okay, and Olivia is gonna do a little bit of demos of some of the pieces that come into what a code pipeline should have. Um, again, we talked about observability. Um, the, Oracle's got a, a deep set of tools to provide all your basic things you'd expect. The logging analytics, the notifications, if something's down, how do I page out to my team when something's broken? And then we provide connector hubs to be able to connect up to your own tools. So if you're using something like PagerDuty, 
right? How do I snap in my tools into OCI so that I can take logging and events and put those all together? Connection Hub allows us to kind of bridge that together, our tools with yours in a way that just snaps them together. We kind of zoom back to the whole architecture, right? And I ran through this really fast, but you know, we're talking about, again, that Vision Corp app that has a load balancer. It's got worker nodes that are supporting Kubernetes pods and apps on top of them. A backend autonomous database um, so that we've got you know, the Oracle database, but with the least amount of um, infrastructure overhead as a customer. Uh, different types of places to store my files. And of course, all the monitoring and pipelines. This is kind of a simplified view of all those pieces that would ultimately take Vision Corp as it is today on premise and what it would potentially look like when we hosted OCI and more of a modern standpoint. And with that, uh, Olivia, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to talk through this slide because I think it's a good dovetail into your uh, demo. And when you're ready, let me know. I'll, I'll give you the screen back so you can jump into that. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Jason. So I want to briefly discuss Resource Manager because, as Jason mentioned, I will be showing in the demo. So if you want to automate the process of building out your infrastructure, you can use a tool called Resource Manager in OCI. So it's basically Terraform as a service. And so you can see right here, let's say you want to replicate your architecture in different environments, be it dev, test, staging, prod, you can use resource manager for that. And you can also manage the state of your infrastructure with the state file. Um, you can also check if there are any changes to the infrastructure, maybe someone changed something manually in the console. You can manage that with drift. You can also roll back to some previous states for your infrastructure. So you have several different options there. So I will be walking you through that in the demo and kind of showing you how that works. All right, so just to kind of give you an example, we have an application right here called MuShop. So let's say you wanted to build this out. Um, we'll cover resource manager and some of the different components that go into this application that we cover today. So going in, into um, an in-depth look of MuShop, there's several different cloud services that go into it. So there's the API gateway, Kubernetes, which Jason covered. Um, functions, monitoring, resource manager to help you automate the process of building it out. And not just that, but managing the state of your infrastructure and being able to replicate it maybe in another environment like dev or test. Events, notifications, logging. And then down here, you can see MuShop. So you can kind of get a picture of how these different services work together to build out this application. Also, before I dive into the console for a demo, we do have the architecture center. So if you did want to explore some other sample architectures outside of MuShop, um, there's a few right here. Another reason why I bring this up is some have the automation capabilities or option to deploy with resource manager. So there's quite a few examples out there besides just MuShop, but MuShop is example that we will be focusing on today. All right, so hopping into the OCI console to first get started. So if you go right here to the developer services, um, you'll find resource manager right here. And if you're first looking to get start, started with resource manager, this is a great place for doing so. And you can see in this overview picture right here, there's several different ways to go about creating your infrastructure. So you have a stack and a stack is basically a collection of Terraform files for the infrastructure that you want to provision. So if it's MuShop, you have Terraform files for the instances, networking, all of that. And so if you already have your own Terraform templates, you can bring that in. You can actually capture a stack from a compartment so you can get the Terraform scripts from there. If you have maybe a repository like GitHub or something, um, you can pull from there. So there's different ways of creating your stack. And then from there, um, you can run a plan job. And this just lets you plan and assess the resources that um, are going to be provisioned. So if you're creating resources, it'll have a plus. It'll have a resource action legend. So it'll let you know the changes that it's going to make. If it's going to delete a resource, it'll have a minus. Maybe it might de delete it and then reprovision it. So it'll have that breakdown for you, but it's not actually 
making any changes at this point. It's just kind of making sure that everything is good to go. Um, and then from there, you can actually go ahead and run your apply job to make those changes. And it'll go ahead and provision that infrastructure for you. And then you can also take a tour. It'll walk you through um, some of the different components here. And then as mentioned, there's different ways of creating a stack. So we'll look into that in a moment. And then if you wanted more documentation, there's some tutorials out there, templates, um, CICD information. And then you can also see what's new with Terraform if you want to stay up to date. And if you want to play around with a sample infrastructure, this is another way to get more familiar with Resource Manager. So if you wanted to deploy a sample e-commerce application using Always Free OCI, you can do so. And then lastly, there's some video tutorials down here. So kind of just a high level overview of Resource Manager, but where you get started is with stacks right here. And so when you create a stack, once again, there's several different ways that you can go about it. So you can do your own configuration. And then and the option that we do today is through an Oracle provided template. So right here, you'll see that there's several different quick starts that you can explore like OKE, sorry, OCI Kubernetes monitoring solution, our studio, several examples here. There's also some service specific templates um, that you can explore. So around subnets, compute instance, all that here. And then you have some architecture specific templates. And so the one that we actually built out today was this new shop example. So I simply selected the stack for this, select that template and it'll load it for me. And then um, once again, there's other options for doing this. So you can pull from Bitbucket, GitHub, or GitLab or something. If maybe you have your stack in one of these locations. So if you do this, you just need to select the source code management type. Um, or you can capture a stack from existing compartment. So you would simply select the compartment that you want to capture the stack from. And you can do it for all the Terraform provider services in that compartment or you can pick and choose the different services um, that you want to get the stack for. So if you're just interested in getting the stack for the database services in that compartment, you can pick and choose that. But once again, in this example today, we're just focusing on um, U-Shop, but of course you can use it for other stuff as well. You would give your stack a name um, and specify in which compartment you wanna create the stack, um, Terraform version, and then once you've done that, you can go to next and then you can review everything and it'll create that stack for you. So that's just kind of a high level overview of how resource manager works. It's nice because it will aut help you automate the process of provisioning that infrastructure. So I used it um, right here. So I did an apply job um, and it provisioned it. You can also destroy it. You can once again plan this infrastructure, but this is what built out this application right here. And it's a very quick process. And then I can also manage the state for that um, infrastructure as well. And then I could also replicate it in other environments. So maybe I want to do it for dev, prod, um, stuff like that. So that's a high level overview of resource manager. So how you can automate your infrastructure, replicate it, and also manage the state for it. There's also a few other things that go into your um, infrastructure and OCI. So one thing to kind of keep in mind, if you want to keep track of the different resources that are being created, you can go to governance and admin right here. And then you can go to tenancy explorer and then you can search the different compartment that you're working in. So for like Mew shop, for example, you could select that um, architecture and then it will list all of the different resources that are in that compartment. So you can kind of keep track of, you know, hey, what was provisioned in this Mew shop um, compartment or environment. So you can kind of keep track of those resource resources right here. Um, so it just kind of takes um, a moment to load. And then from there, um, since no resources are loaded right now, um, once they are, you can click on the different resources 
And you can also manage the tags for them. So this would be helpful if maybe you want to tag your different resources by environment. So maybe by like dev, test, or prod. So you can, you know, do it that way or keep track of those tags or remove them. That's how you do that. And so, yeah, right here, you can see all the different resources in our Mew shop um, compartment. And then once again, you know, you can manage the tags for that just to kind of keep track of these specific resources or adding metadata to them. So you can see the resources um, attached to the, to the um, resource or the tags attached to the resource, and then you could remove it or apply it. So that's a tool to be aware of, you know, if you're creating your infrastructure with resource manager and want to, you know, keep tabs on those different resources and also the tags for that. All right. So another component of this is um, Kubernetes. So you can find this right here. Um, so this case, it should have already provisioned one, um, but you can also, you know, create a cluster. So with quick create, it'll give you an idea of the different resources that it will include. So provision the VCN, the different gateways like internet gateway, um, NAT gateway, service gateway, the Kubernetes cluster. Um, you can also do um, custom create right here. And so it'll create these resources for you. So you can do that as well. Another component of this is that you also want to take a look at the different networking components that were provisioned. So right here, you'll see that it created um, a VCN right here. And um, if you wanted to kind of get a little bit more insight into your different um, networking components, like how are they being um, routed, the security, all of that, you can go down to the network command center right here. And this is a great way of visualizing your networks because you've set everything up with resource manager. You also maybe have insight into all the different resources in your compartment. But if you really want to drill down, you know, into your networking, for example, you can do this with the network command center. So you could launch the network visualizer. And right here, um, you can search your different compartments and it'll show you the different networking components there. So it's created a um, U-Shop VCN for us right here. And when you're fil filtering, you can change the compartment and you can also include child compartments. So I'm gonna click on the VCN and you can see some general information. So if you click this, um, it'll lead you to the VCN page. Um, you can also see the default route table um, you can also view the VCN routing map. So clicking into this um, will give me a better look at how um, things are being routed in general. So you can see your service gateway, your internet gateway. Um, you can see your subnet right here. And once again, if you want to click into these different resources, it'll let you. Um, so you can see the routing for that. Um, same for this subnet right here. And then you can also see the security routing. So this is your security list. Um, so you can see that information here. And then if you want to click into that security list, you could go ahead and do so by doing this and it will take you to um, the location. But yeah, just good to have insight into general your network routing and also the security around it. But yeah, that's a high level overview and then once again, you can always explore Architecture Center, but we just want to go through the MuShop example and kind of show you once you've deployed that infrastructure, there's different things that you can look into, like the Network Command Center, Tenancy Explorer, and you can also use Resource Manager to automate that process. All right, and with that, I'll pass it over to Lynn to take us through multi-cloud. So we're gonna talk about multi-cloud in this case, the specifics of the vision is Vision Corp going through the process of now uh, they modernized their and hosted on OCI and they want to take a look at integrating it with some tools on Azure. So one of the things that they would look for is more robust disaster recovery options, easier migration, easier scalability and agility. And this would be the case where there's perhaps some services that would be available on Azure 
or on Oracle that would be better than a, on Oracle or Azure. So it's a, taking advantage of what makes sense for you. The nice thing about the world as it is today, not only is we have the respective providers built out everything for you up front and that you can access it depending upon your contract and what you what software you've written it's all software right now everything's built you just have to access it then it's just a matter of taking advantage of what makes sense for you what makes sense for your organization what makes it easier to do the work and to cost the least and it's our job to now that we're on this treadmill to keep running and keep moving and keep get providing you with more value at every level. Otherwise you'll go somewhere else. So the key element of multi-cloud environment in particular with respect to our partnership with our frenemies at Microsoft is that we both have the capability of you dropping cable from your data center to the backbone of the internet and therefore then access our respective data centers directly. So in that case, you would be Fast Connect VPN or Express Route VPN. You do have to have both if you want to have access to this. And then in those locations, as has been noted before, where we are, we share space in the same data center, then we can just drop cable between their racks and our racks, or our racks and their racks, however you want to look at it. And then it's just a matter of using those resources in a way that makes sense to you. The reason why the, both of these are required is because we want to make sure as a team that no matter where your users access the data from, you have the absolute minimum time for waiting, right? So that's the whole purpose of this, whether it be communication between the inside the data center or to your data center, we wanna make sure, or your other data center. So it has to be uh, such that it, it makes sense from a perspective of latency. Speed of light is still the speed of light. We identify, you, the other thing that we work with is because we're all, we have the tools that we can talk to Active Directory and Active Directory can talk to us. We have unified access management. We have collaborative support for work, workloads across clouds. We, we had a capability of doing this, but we've continued to improve that. And we've continued to uh, improve our pricing across uh, for sharing data across this. So that's another another approach. So the, the, the thing, if you look at it from a technical perspective, and this is just a diagram of what I just said, right? So you, you have Oracle Database for Azure, you have Microsoft Azure over here and in, uh, in that respect, uh, you, could, you could have a particular set of applications, for example, uh, comes to mind, J.D. Edwards. J.D. Edwards runs on SQL as well as it runs on database, depending upon the size of the user base, right? So you could have J.D. Edwards running over here on OCI, and why on OCI? Well, because in, uh, we have this whole set of tools that make it very easy to migrate from a data center to our OCI, and that includes the data center to migrate from your data center to Azure to use SQL. So those are the types of things. Likewise, there are enterprise comp com countries that com companies that really like Oracle Data System, and in some cases, it's it's utilized directly through the Microsoft Azure portal in that respect. Or it can be in the sense of they have an application here or an application that they have written that they're at, that is accessed through Azure and goes directly to autonomous database. So it depends upon how you want to access it and what grouping of utilization you want. And in both cases, you make sure your identity and access management is in place that crosstalks. So you have federated groups, you have federated users, so it doesn't really matter where you start. In theory, <laughs> if you set it up properly, you should be able to log in once in the, at the beginning of the day and then move as a user from one application to another, from one cloud to another. Now, and I see this 
in Oracle as well. If, if I go and want to do one set of things, then sometimes it'll ask me for additional login through my laptop, uh, through our uh, two forms of uh, identification. And then if I go to our Oracle University and I'm reviewing something before I teach it, and, and I often do that, it, then, then it wants me to, then it makes me use my telephone. <laughs> So you, you're going to have to do that. Of course, my bank makes me use my telephone, too. So it's just the way of the world today. So the key element is what makes sense for you. The best practice is the practice that you're going to utilize that's going to give you the resiliency and reliability that you require. It's going to give you the operational efficiency that, you, that improves your business workflow, that it gives you the security and compliance that makes sense for you in your circumstance. So it, 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 what the best practice is the practice that makes sense for you. Now, we have our best practices. Microsoft has their best practice, but what the real best practice is what you make sense, what makes sense for you, what you're going to stick to, what's going to be easier for you onboard people, what's going to make it easier for you to uh, get things done on a daily basis and, and not complicate your, your workflow in any way. And sometimes that's iterative, right? It's going to change over time. Your company's going to, some groups are going to grow, some Groups are going to decay. You're going to you're going to change focus. You're going to change goals. Those things are, are going to impact your best practices because it's going to impact your business goals. So we're going to give you uh, some links here at the end, uh, whether it be Oracle University. I can't recommend that enough. But you can also let me go off script a little bit. And now Renu just broke out into a sweat. But you can always go to our web pages and go to documentation. So you can you really have a good set of documentation. The other good thing about our documentation for OCI, it shows you what's new, what's beta. As Jason mentioned, our generative AI. We also have a new globally distributed autonomous database, as well as the uh, Redis uh, capability uh, for caching world, worldwide. We have our observability and management tools. We have storage and our marketplace, which is a curated set of tools that we don't charge any extra for, but other folks will in that respect. So it's not like your Apple marketplace or Google marketplace. So in addition to that, we have the, our architecture center, as uh, Olivia referenced with respect to different architectures. Many of these architectures, not 100%, but many of these architectures have Terraform code examples in place or Anstable or both. So they really are places to learn and study and, and work through the process. Likewise, we have these tutorials and you can either run them on your tenancy or you can run them in a free lab. Not all of them are available for on free labs, but many of them are. And in addition to that, at the very least, you can just go through the template, sort of like looking at uh, a recipe in a cookbook and decide up front, do you want to do that or not? And, and what does it take to do it? Do you want to access all those resources in your tenancy, or is it just a networking test and networking doesn't cost you anything? Right, but but it can help you understand the requirements that you have. This is another live labs a uh, home base that's uh, actually hosted uh, in in our apps. But the other thing to point out is you go to GitHub and you and you search for Oracle, you're going to find a whole set of example code, whether it be data science code or Python code or R code, so all that's available. Those of you that are database uh, geeks, I would strongly recommend you take a look at uh, and get an account on Ac Ask Tom. It's free. It has a host of different presentations that are available for you and, and videos that are in place. They have office hours, resources for you to train yourself up on, classes for you to train. These are very focused on data, database and data systems, but it, they're continually improving and coming across because our product 
is continually improving and and to use it properly you're going to have to spend some time with it the other thing i would point out is that on youtube we also have a whole set of uh videos some of those videos are very specific last two minutes you want to know how to do one thing in analytics that's in our our oracle analytics you can search for that there may be a five minute video on how to do that if you search for analytics you might find a five hour video on how to really work with our analytics for a pixel perfect report in that respect but in every case you can find additional information um, as noted under youtube user oracle learning jason uh, do you have any parting remarks <laughs> no my only part of remark is um when you get into any of these designs multi-cloud um, whether you're getting into native cloud, definitely make sure you uh, engage your Oracle account team, right? This is your account reps. This is your architects, your engineers. We're here to help you all along the journey. We're here to bring your resources, do demos, get on site. Um, there's a larger team that's kind of the sister group team to Renew and, and um, Lynn and Livia here that can help provide Code Innovate Days. Um, there's just a wealth of resources to help onboard and get you through whatever your leadership team's asked you to do. Modernize, lift and shift, go cloud native. Engage us. We'll give you a hand and get it set up. Biggest things I like to reinforce with any group, in any presentation with respect to OCI is sort of the summation that it's all built for you already. All you have to do is access it. All you have to do is learn how to work with the, the software we provide, to work with the operating system for the data center that we provide. Uh, it's all software now, whether it be your networking, whether it be your security, it's all software. All you have to do is reach out and grab it and use it and think about it in a way that makes sense for your business. And if it doesn't work, change it. You don't ha you're not r stuck with anything anymore. And we're constantly operating the hardware and the services. So it really does make sense that you can move the way you want to and the best practices I mentioned, yes, there's some guidelines, but what really is the best practice is the one that you will use and that will keep you secure and meet your requirements. That's really it. Great guidance. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Jason, Lynn, and Olivia for another great session and all those tidbits that you shared. I hope everyone enjoyed it and learned something new today. Our next session will be Oracle Cloud Security Quick Start on April 16th at 10 a.m. PT. This session will cover various security features and services offered by OCI to secure your Oracle Cloud workloads. Um, we will also cover how security is built into each component of your cloud environment and will focus on the different tools you have at your disposal to improve your security posture. So if you are interested, please do not forget to go to the Devon and Beyond page and register for the next session. I recommend that you bookmark the Devon and Beyond page and check frequently for new sessions on trending topics. With that, thanks again for joining us. See you all next time. Have a great day, everyone.